Hi, I'm Christopher Warnock of Renaissance Astrology, and today I'd like to talk about the Shams Amarif and uh, Sufi magic talismans, um, as well as you know my background in Sufism. Um, you know, Sufism is something that's really uh, important to me. Uh, I'm not s strongly practicing it right now because I'm not in contact with uh, any particular Sufi orders. I live in Iowa. It's a little exotic uh, for Iowa, um, but. I do have a significant background in Sufism, and it's a significant and important part of my spiritual path. Um, when I was in Washington, D.C., I came into contact with the, the Nima Talahi uh, Sufi uh, Tariqa, which is uh, one of the Sufi orders. This is uh, Iranian Sufi, so it's Shia Sufi. Um, they had a Hanaha, which is the house of a sheikh. Uh, the sheikh is sort of like the spiritual leader, sort of like a guru in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, so uh, I was initiated uh, as a darvish and then participated in the sama, which is the sort of musical ceremony. Um, this consists of um, playing sitar, drumming, and then chanting the zikr, which are the names of God and, and other types of chants. Um, pretty incredible opportunity. Um, the, um, the musicians that were playing for us were some of the finest uh, in the world. This Iranian uh, classical music basically is Sufi music. Um, we had an, an artist named Lutfi, who was uh, very well known, who would, who would come and play for us on occasion. But we, it was really incredible to, to be part of it and to experience also the, the um, uh, Iranian culture, which is quite rich and uh, full. And again, you know, people think of Islam or whatever, Sufis as just being Arabic, but there's a, it's a whole, it's very broad, you know, even in the, in the Middle East. And then of course, Sufism is universal and embraces, um, you know, all, all types of people, anyone who's interested in, in being part of it. Um, so, um, you know, I, um, unfortunately there's, you know, a lot of internal politics and things like that. And I, I basically took, the experience that I had there is about as far as I could go. I don't speak Farsi, I don't speak Arabic, um, and there wasn't a sheikh who was permanently present who I was able to develop a, a relationship with. So, um, I, nevertheless, it was uh, my experience there has deeply touched me and continues to be an important part of my spiritual practice, and um, you know, even on a on a daily basis. So, you know, when I um, I have a student in Pakistan, Muhammad Ajmal, who's now currently creating uh, talismans for me. Um, and, you know, I was very happy to work with him again because I have a very positive uh, view of, um, you know, Sufism and, and that sort of magic and things like that from the Middle East. And he is someone who has a lot of experience um, with uh, uh, magic talismans and, um, and then also using the Shams al-Marif which is in other traditional sources. So that was something I was very excited to get involved with. And while we also do regular uh, Renaissance style talismans, we also um, are doing lots of uh, Sufi magic talismans um, as well. So it's interesting because while you know, we've heard of Picatrix, which is an, an Arabic source, um, the Shams al-Marif, which means the son of wisdom, is a much more widely known and much more used book of magic in the, uh, in the Middle East, um, incredibly popular. Um, now, the Shams al-Marif was traditionally attributed to the 13th century Sufi uh, and master of the esoteric sciences, um, Ahmad uh, bin Ali ibn Buna, it's typically known as al al-Buni. Um, the um, current scholarship notes that there's, you know, if you look at Shams al-Marif, um, it, um, it looks like it's dating from the 17th century. And rather than being a medieval source by Al Buni, it's probably was put together and then attributed to him. You know, and what's interesting about this is that the scholars basically end at that. I mean, they're like, well, it's falsely attributed. It's what they would call falsely attributed, um, and therefore, you know, we can just ignore it. Whereas, in fact, this is pretty normal that you know these various compilations or collections would be traditionally attributed to somebody, um, and you know that they took that less seriously as the, the scholarship because what they're interested in is actually using it and how much wisdom it contained and what sort of practical use could be made of it. Um, so the uh, the practical use of, uh, of Shams al Marif is, is incredibly wide, and, it, and it's very well known. And it's something I've been able to have, you know, sort of fragmentary translations of. You can look on my website. We've got a couple different translations and then some discussion uh, in depth of it. You can take a look at that on, on the Renaissance Astrology website. So, you know, like Picatrix, 
the Shams al is, is not just a recipe book of talismans. Um, in fact, really talismans are not the primary purpose of it. Um, really what it, the Shams al is about is explicating this esoteric wisdom um, that's expressed through an understanding of the cosmos as being created, composed, and maintained by the One, whether you want to call that Allah or God or whatever, um, through the divine speech. So this is very much focused on um, speech as well as uh, letters and alphabet. Um, and so there's this view that the letters that we have, the spoken word and the written letters, are echoes or shadows of the divine letters. And really that the cosmos is created through the speech. I mean, there's a, a, a numerous references in the Quran they say, where they say, Allah says, be, and, and something, Ibel, he comes into to being as soon as it's, it's spoken or invoked in that, in that method. So, um, while we can understand the, the nature of the cosmos through this, it's very much like Kabbalah. Um, we also can do magical effects or, ha or have this sort of, um, you know, uh, magic done through this, what's called the Ilm al Haruf or the mystic science of letters. Um, so, really what we're dealing with here is sort of, sort of constituent, um, you know, uh, elements of reality uh, in this particular tradition. So, in addition to that, um, the Shams al Marif uh, and in the Sufi magic in general makes use of the, of the, the uh, names of Allah. Now, often known as the 99 beautiful names, um, in fact, there's infinite numbers of names. I mean, if you, anything you describe is essentially God, if you really look through it carefully enough, is the one. Um, but the beautiful names are those which are used esoterically and they're most respectful to use. And what's really interesting about these is each of these names shows a particular relationship of the one to the many. Um, and it, you can really compare it very similar to the Platonic ideas or archetypes. Um, so, for example, the, uh, the, one of the greatest Sufi mystics, Ibn Arabi, um, for example, says that the, the one requires the many. Um, for example, Arab, Lord, cannot exist without a servant. So, so God, in a sense, uh, requires you, because in order to, to have God, there also has to be the Creator. The Creator has to have the Created. So it's, it's a much deeper relationship and much more interesting on an, on an esoteric level. Um, and again, this feeds into this whole idea of the Platonic ideas. They're all basic relationships. Um, so I think this is a really um, very interesting, and again, like Picatrix, by looking at this and we're thinking, oh, we're going to do talismans, actually these vistas of, you know, incredible esoteric knowledge and wisdom and really the nature of the universe and the cosmos is really opened up to us. Um, another thing that the Shams al uses and other traditional sources um, in Sufi magic use are what are called are magic squares. Um, and, you know, we've, we're familiar with the planetary squares. Um, these are taken to incredible, you know, lengths in this, in this uh, magic. Um, Essentially, if you think of both Hebrew and Arabic, the uh, letters are also used as numbers. So there's a, um, there's a correspondence between a letter and a number. And so if you take the name of something, you can turn it into a number. And there's incredible, um, you know, esoteric uh, use of changing these around and, and permutations and really beyond my knowledge, but very interesting and um, exciting a way to work with uh, with this astrological. And then what they'll do is combine all these things. So we've got Quranic verses, which are very powerful. So again, the, the Quran is like the Torah. It's seen as a, uh, again, an archetype of the cosmos. And um, so the letter magic, Quranic verses, and then the names of Allah. And then the timing is all done astrologically. And so that gives us um, a way to orient ourselves. And so the, the power is sort of multiplied because you have all these different sources of essentially cosmic power and esoteric power, and then also the astrological power as well. Um, and, and a further, something that's really interesting is that because there's 28 letters of the Arabic alphabet and there's 28 uh, mansions of the moon, uh, the letter corresponds to the mansions are, are particularly uh, influential and, and, and used in this, um, this Sufi magic. Um, so still, you know, the, the Shams al-Marif, you know, is definitely a Sufi text. Um, while it's got a lot of use talismanically, like I said, it's giving incredible information and wisdom, um, and it really exemplifies this, this uh, Sufi wisdom. So it's really been exciting for me to, to work with it, and, you know, it's one of the things that's opened up to me 
um, from you know making these talismans. Now, this science of letters, the Ilm al um, as well as talismans, are also used spiritually, um, plays an important part in um, Sufi ritual and then chanting, as I was mentioning, and then also uh, can be used to chant to reach higher states of consciousness. And the, the Sufi master, F.A. Ali and Sinosi says, um, just as the vocalized letter of the alphabet issue from the breath of the human breather, so the existent things within the cosmos come from the breath of the all-merciful, nafs al-Rahman. Through the breath of the all-merciful, Allah emerged from his essence, and the cosmos was made visible through the letters spoken upon this divine breath. So the place of articulation of letters within the human breather corresponds to the preparedness of the mutable and fixed entities. Um, so we can see this incredible macrocosm and microcosm, that there's a microcosmic use of letters, and they're not just conventional, they're not just made up, but these have a, a very strong spiritual power that uh, is connected to the, the letter, written letters that connect to the, the ultimate archetypal letters, which are the constituents of the, of the cosmos. So, you know, we can use them talismanically, magically, but we can also use them as a, a way to Gnostic union. So again, it's, I think it's very exciting. We have a, a wide variety of different Sufi magic talismans. Um, you know, I really encourage people to take a look at these. Um, there's, there can be a certain amount of people are like prejudiced against them or something, this is something they're worried about them, but it's like these are really positive. Um, you know, I've had really positive results for them. And, you know, really, like I said, Sufism is a really important part of my spiritual um, uh, path. And I can really attest to the fact that they're very uplifting, very powerful, and uh, something that's definitely very useful to work with and, and, again, very positive. So, again, I hope you take a look at the uh, Sufi magic talismans that we have available on the Renaissance Astrology website. Um, also take a look at the sections on the Shams al-Marif. And hopefully you will uh, be, have your interest peak just like I did and find this to be uh, an exciting and interesting way to expand both magically and also spiritually.